Okay. I am Arthur Gilbert, the uh, presiding justice of Division VI of the California Court of Appeal, 2nd District, and I have the distinct privilege and honor of uh, interviewing a dear friend of mine and one of our most preeminent justices on our court, uh, Richard Aldridge. Uh, we go back many years and uh, you have distinguished yourself as not only a preeminent trial attorney who has won so many awards, but you've wrought so many changes within the California judiciary that have been used nationwide. Uh, you have made a difference and your legacy is going to last for years. And Thank it's you. really a, 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 indeed a privilege to, um, to participate in this. But let's go back um, and start from the beginning, if we will, and talk about your life a little. Uh, I guess when we're young, we never realize where we're going to wind up or what's going to happen or who we're going to know or what's going to happen. But tell us about where you were born and uh, influences in your life. Well, I was born in Los Angeles, uh, in fact, not very far from where we're sitting, probably within two or three miles at the California Hospital in 1938. So as of last June, I was 76 years old. Uh, I grew up uh, initially at 1031 and a half West 22nd Street, which is roughly uh, oh, 22nd Street and Union Avenue, not very far from here. And the majority of my youth was spent in Limerick Park and uh, on 9th Avenue. and. Uh, all of my friends and were from that neighborhood. Still have contacts with some of these friends? No, I don't, unfortunately. Um, uh, after high school and college, you just lose track, and right. so I haven't, I haven't seen any of them. One of our colleagues who's, with, who's in private practice now is Elwood Louie, and he was born close to the, this uh, same location. And uh, a lot of his friends, uh, he's still friends with them, and uh, Bert Pines, who became the oh, yes. city attorney, and uh, Dick Wynn Trevisan, a judge. And they were all friends and Great. never realized they'd wind up where they did. So where'd you go to school? I went to um, high school at Mount Carmel High School, which is on uh, approximately Hoover and Florence Avenues. And uh, then after graduation, I uh, went to Loyola University it's now Loyola Marymount University, but in those days, it was an all-male campus. Now we're, we have co-ed there, and uh, graduated from uh, Loyola in 1963, and then went to UCLA Law School, where I uh, earned my LLB, now called a JD degree. You want to tell us a little bit about your parents? My, uh, my mother uh, was an immigrant from Mexico. Her whole family came here in the uh, late 20s. Um, all of them became United States citizens. I remember as a young child being in, in uh, my grandmother and my aunt's home while they were studying for their citizenship examination. Um, all of them went to work immediately in the garment industry uh, my aunt, uh, Aurora, became a designer of costumes for the Shipstads and Johnson's Ice Follies. And uh, my mother, who uh, was quite pretty, became an extra in the movies in Hollywood. Uh, my father was born in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, went to uh, Manual Arts High School. Um, this was during the Depression and after he finished high school, he had to go to work to help support the family. There were five children. And so uh, he became a plumber and uh, was a plumber during his entire work life. And uh, unfortunately, my mother died quite young when she was 49 of uh, cancer. And my, mother, my father uh, died when he was 79 of lung cancer, which is not too surprising because he was a heavy, heavy smoker. So, um, so you went to, um, uh, you didn't have any brothers or sisters? I do. I have a sister, Linda, who is five years my junior, and then I have a brother, uh, Ronnie, who is 16 years my junior. And when you're growing up, tell us a little bit about growing up with you. Well, it was, I had some very wonderful experiences growing up and some uh, not so pleasant experiences. 
Um, when I was 12 years old, uh, in 1950, we had, there was a large polio epidemic that swept through Southern California. And uh, about the middle of December of 1950, I came down with what I thought was a bad cold. Uh, lethargic, had no energy, a sore throat, uh, elevated temperature. And so I stayed home for about a week and it didn't seem to be getting better, it seemed to be getting worse. And so on Christmas Eve of uh, 1950, uh, my mother called the doctor and in those days, doctors made house calls. So he came to the house and examined me and then asked to speak to my mother in the other room. And even at 12 years old, I knew that probably wasn't good. Although I really didn't know anything about polio at that time but he told my mother that he strongly suspected that I had polio. And so that afternoon, uh, my father of course came home and they took me to the only hospital in Los Angeles that would take polio patients. That was the Los Angeles County General Hospital. And I can remember walking into the hospital, no ill effects at all, and not knowing that would be the last time I would, I would walk without assistance. And uh, so I stayed at the Los Angeles County General Hospital from Christmas Eve uh, until the day after New Year, January 2nd of 1951. And then I was transferred to the orthopedic hospital in, in Los Angeles, where I stayed for a month, um, where they gave me physical therapy and hot packs on my, on my legs and extremities. Um, I can remember very clearly losing the strength of my of my left leg and left arm uh, while I was in the county hospital. There was one day they had just finished with the hot packs and I was laying there alone and I don't know what came over me but I had the sensation that I was losing the strength in my legs and I started moving, lifting my legs up off the bed and flailing my arms in the air and I kept doing it and then gradually I could feel the left leg all of a sudden I couldn't lift it off the bed anymore and uh, as a result after I came out of the hospital my left leg and left arm were were paralyzed um, fortunately the left arm came back with practically no ill effects uh, the left leg I still wear a, a leg brace from inside my shoe to my hip. And when I walk, I have to walk with the leg, the knee locked, because without any muscle, musculature, quadriceps on that leg, if I, if I flexed or bent my leg at all and put weight on it, it would collapse. So that's how I spent my childhood uh, after that, from age 12 uh, to the present, in, trying to overcome, if you will, overcome my disability, adjust to my disability. Um, I was always a pretty, a very competitive type of person. Even before the polio, I loved athletics and sports. And I was a fierce competitor. I, I wanted to win. Um, after the polio, it was a competition, not with anyone else, it was a competition with myself of being, quote, normal. I wanted to be normal. I wanted to wear normal shoes. I wanted to walk normally. Everything in, in my mind was to be normal, whatever that means. Um, so I, I just had to work harder to overcome the disability. And, and looking back on it, I think it was both character building and instilled in me a strong self of, uh, of achievement, of having to, to overachieve in everything I did. Well, you certainly achieved, so that was, uh, was an important part of the formative years of your life. It was, it was a life-altering experience, yes. and uh, I think it did give me a, a greater appreciation of life, of, of the health that I've that I've enjoyed throughout my life other than, other than that. 
Uh, of course, it also, I wanted to say it gave me a, a, uh, a great empathy for people with disability, but that didn't come till much later. Um, because frankly, with only one leg affected, I never considered myself disabled. Yeah. I knew that I had a much more difficult time in my law practice, especially in fed when I had a federal court case, because there were no parking lots near the federal courthouse. I usually had a very heavy document bag or briefcase that I was carrying to and from my hearings or trials. So I'd have to park my car, walk the block or more to get to the courthouse, climb a set of stairs, try to struggle with those enormously heavy doors in the old federal courthouse, and then start to do my job as a lawyer for my client. So all of that was, uh, was uh, character building. So what got you into law in the first place? So you went, you went to high school. I went to high and school. And then you went to, uh, you decided you're going to, you said you're the first person in your family to go to college. I was the first person and, in my family to ever go to college. And you were, when did you decide you were going to go to college? Or? Well, I, when I was in high school in my second year and my sophomore year, there was a Carmelite priest who was my history teacher, Kevin Morrissey. And in those days, when, when he'd assign homework to us, uh, say a paper we would have to write on George Washington, when we came in the next day, he would call upon certain of the students to get up in front of the class and orally present their paper to the class. I don't remember exactly what my paper was on. I don't think it was George Washington, but I did. I got up in front of the class and I read my paper to them and told them a little bit about my, my studying of the, my subject, whoever it was. And as soon as I'd finished, Father Morrissey up there, in the parochial schools, their desks were on platforms. And I remember him looking down at me and he said, Richard, you'd make a fine lawyer. And it stuck. From that day forward, Boy. the only thing I ever wanted to be was a lawyer. That's, a, that's really quite a story. And you hadn't, you know, like you talk to people and they say, well, I watched Perry Mason or I saw this. This wasn't that. This was just Something someone said to you, a teacher you respected, obviously. Huh? Yeah, Perry Mason triggered a memory of my, my first trial as a lawyer. We can go back to that. Yeah. But, uh, I didn't know any lawyers. Uh, there were no lawyers in my family or judges. Uh, when I applied to UCLA Law School, yes. on the application, they asked that you list references. And under that section of references, there was a little parenthesis, we prefer lawyers or judges. Well, I didn't know any lawyers or judges, but I had a car, and so I drove down to downtown Los Angeles, and at that time, they were trying cases in the old Hall of Records. Yes, I remember in that. Downtown. I Yes, I've tried a few cases there. And I remember the elevator was a freight elevator. And so I parked my car in a parking lot, or maybe on the street, went up in the elevator to a floor there were courtrooms on, and I walked down this hallway until I found a courtroom, opened the door, and it was dark. But at the other end of the courtroom, I could see a door that was open with light coming from it. So I went to the door and I knocked on the door and this rather gruff voice said, who is it? And I said, excuse me, your honor. I said, my name is Richard Aldrich. He said, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm applying to law school and they've asked that I have a reference by a judge or a lawyer. And I don't know any judges or lawyers and I would wonder, was wondering if I could talk to you about maybe putting you down as a reference. He said, come in. So I came in and I sat down. The judge was Clement D. Nye. I remember him. Oh my heavens. And his nickname was Clemency Denied. Yes. Because he yes. was a very tough sentencer. He was a tough guy. <laughs> tough he, he couldn't have been more charming. Yeah. He, we sat and we talked for over an hour. Terrific. And at the end of it he said, 
I'll be glad to be your reference. You want me to write a letter or what? I said, no, I'd just like your permission to put your name down and they might contact you. He said, fine, put my name down. If they contact me, I'll write you a, a good letter of recommendation. How so enterprising of you. Well, and that was, that was my only, that was my first time in a courtroom. Yeah. So when I got out of law school, I had a job already lined up and I took the job because my boss assured me that I would be in trial within three weeks of the time I was sworn in. How were you able to line up a job so soon? Were you a good law student or you were interested in uh, moot court or? All, all of those things. I, I was a, a good law student. Uh, I, I loved moot court. I was watched Perry Mason as what started this, and I knew how lawyers acted in a courtroom. If you had a point you wanted to make, you walked right up to the witness and you <laughs> told him. So in my first trial, and, and my boss didn't quite make it three weeks, but a month after I was sworn in, I was assigned my first a personal, a plaintiff's personal injury lawsuit. So this was a plaintiff's, because um, you actually went to the other side of it. For a while, for a yeah, while. For a while, then you were about to, Then I went back. Yeah. And so this was a plaintiff's firm. Uh, the lawyer that hired me was David Harney, who yes. was oh. quite famous, brilliant. One of the most brilliant lawyers. Around. I've watched him in action, we all have. Brilliant trial yeah. lawyer. So he gave me this rear-end automobile accident case to do, take to trial. So uh, having seen Perry Mason, whenever I wanted to show the witness a document, I just walked right up to the witness and showed him. Uh, sometimes I got r right up on the witness's face if I was cross-examining the witness. At the first break, the judge, who was a very kindly man, uh, his name was Bernard Jefferson. Oh, yes. Who came to this court later. Absolutely. And he knew it was my first trial. Yeah. The defense lawyer knew it was my first trial. It was probably painfully obvious to the jury that it was my first trial. But Bernard Jefferson, being the perfect gentleman that he was, didn't want to embarrass me in front of the jury. So at the first recess, he asked his bailiff to come over and talk to me and tell me. So at the first break, why, uh, the bailiff came up to me and he said, now, Mr. Aldridge, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, when you question witnesses, you question them either behind the counsel table or from the lectern. You never approach them. If you have to approach them to show the witness a document, you ask the court's permission, Your Honor, may I approach? And the court will then say, yes, you may approach. Then you go up to the witness. And he said, that area between the counsel table and the bench, he said, that's no man's land. That's the well. You never, ever, under any circumstances, go in there. Now, you understand that? I said, oh, yes, I get it, I get it. Of course, the adrenaline was pumping. It was my first jury trial. and I had these. So the very next session, not only did I approach the witness without permission, not only did I stand in the well, I think at one point I even may have put my elbow up on the bench. <laughs> As soon as my elbow hit wood, I thought, oh no, what have I done? And I looked up and this kindly Bernard Jefferson was leaning over the bench with a big grin on his face. And I backed out so quickly, I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I forgot it won't happen again. And it never did happen again. Why? Uh, so That's a great Bernie Jefferson story too as well. He was, he was a great man, a brilliant jurist, yeah. uh, Sweetheart, wrote, right. wrote the definitive uh, book on evidence. I know, I actually edit uh, part of that book. I'm my, just finishing editing, editing a chapter <laughs> today. I, so isn't that amazing? Well, at, at that time, uh, his brother was already on this yes. court. Edwin, was that Edwin, Edwin Jefferson? Edwin Jefferson. Yes. And then uh, he joined uh, yes. much later. Right, right. And these stories stay with you forever, don't they? Forever. They're defining moments. So, so you were with the Harney firm, I was and with that was a, may I ask, do you remember how the case turned out? I lost. Okay. I lost, resoundingly. Uh, in fact, before that case, the defendant was insured with the auto club, and the auto club was represented 
by the firm that was known at those days as Gilbert Thompson, Thompson and, and Kelly. Kelly. I tried a case against Gilbert, the two Gilberts. Tough. Tough guy, Tough huh? guys. Oh, boy. Well, the lawyer I drew from that firm was a man by the name of George Quietnan. Kit Quietnan, he was probably the meanest man I ever met in my life up, up to that point. And before the case started, he came up to me in the hallway. And he said, Aldrich, he said, they're gonna, the sending the jury up. How much do you want for this turkey? So I swallowed hard. I said, $5,000. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you $2,500 for this case, and it's not worth any of that. And if you don't take it, I'm going to chew you up, and I'm going to spit you out all over that courtroom. So for the next week and a half, <laughs> he did he precisely did. that. But a great learning experience. It was a great learning experience, and uh, that's how I got my, my taste for trial work. So, uh, so, the spot, so you licked your wounds, and what happened next? I got another case to try, uh -huh. and uh, it was uh, a more difficult case, and uh, I lost that one too, but that's okay, that, that's the way you learn. Um, I licked my wounds from that, and then I started winning a few cases. And uh, David Harney, rest his soul, what a great lawyer he was, he, was, he really uh, trailblazed for the rest of the legal profession products liability as we know it today. Um, his partner just before I joined the firm was a man by the name of Ralph Drummond and Ralph Drummond became a, a judge and uh, also a very close personal friend. Ralph Drummond's stepson Donnie Lyford was killed in uh, between Carmel and Monterey on Highway 68 in what they call the Carmel Pacific Grove cutoff while driving a Corvair automobile. And uh, the police couldn't put together why the automobile had gone out of control and gone across the center lanes and into the oncoming traffic. And of course, uh, Donnie was killed. And so, I think probably out of uh, consideration for his former partner, Ralph, Dave took the case. And he started looking into the dy automobile dynamics of the Corvair automobile and became convinced that the Corvair was defectively designed. Now this is the, this is the early 1960s. I remember so, the case. Uh, he didn't have all, there were no seat belts in cars in those days. And so, uh, uh, Dave had tried three, taken three of those Corvair cases to verdict and lost them all. General Motors had won them all. And in fact, General Motors were winning the cases across the country. Um, I think partly because the public just couldn't imagine that General Motors, at that time the largest corporation in the world, could ever put a car on the road that was defectively designed. Um, and one of the examples they always used to use and they did in my trial was the Volkswagen. We well, don't see a lot of Volkswagen cases around. Well, you, you did later. Uh, but there was, there was no question in my mind that the car was defectively designed. Anyway, David lost uh, the first three cases and he was in trial in his fourth and one day I was sitting in my chambers, minding my own business. Well, not your chambers then, right? I mean, I mean my, office my office. <laughs> yes, Excuse me. I've done that too. Thank you. <laughs> my office, and Dave was on a break. I don't know, I guess it was after court. And Dave walked in with two arms full of files. And I looked up and I said, what's that? He said, this is your next trial. I said, oh, okay, what is it? He said, it's a Corvair case. And my heart sank. I said, well, I'll be glad to try it, but one, I'm not an engineer. Two, I didn't do very well in math. I'm not an automobile dynamics expert by any means. He said, don't worry about it. You'll spend a month with our expert, Paul O'Shea. He'll teach you everything you have to know 
about automobile dynamics. By that time, that was 1966. And I remember putting my family on the airplane the week before I started trial to Hawaii for a vacation. And I said, look, I'm gonna settle this case, so I'll join you in, in about a week. It was a terrible Corvair case. It didn't really fit the Corvair rollover pattern that we had developed. And so Dave said, look, settle the case for whatever you can get out of it. But I don't wanna dismiss the case for, for no money because that's gonna show a sign of weakness. So with that kind of uh, carte blanche authority, I was sure I was gonna settle the case. So I'd forgotten what my initial demand was, but five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And we were looking at a six to eight week trial. So I walked up the first, I walked in the first day of trial to the chambers of the judge. The General Motors attorney was there, the attorney for Tom Carroll Chevrolet was there. And I said, well, maybe I can make this easy on everyone. Um, I have authority to settle this case for $25,000. And the General Motors attorney looked at me and he said, we are not paying one nickel to settle this case. So I said, all right. And we tried that case for almost eight weeks in front of the jury. And at the end of the case, the jury came in with a plaintiff's verdict. And it was the first plaintiff's verdict, one of the only plaintiff's verdict against General Motors involving the defectively designed Corvair in the country. Boy, that must have felt good. And didn't Bernie Jefferson try some of the Corvair cases? He tried one. He tried one. I and, remember seeing a Corvair engine in his courtroom Well, when I was a young lawyer. In fact, we had the rear end assemblies on the Corvair, on the Volkswagen, and on the Renault, all rear engine automobiles, and we had them put on on uh, stands so you could actually turn yeah. the entire rear of the right. automobile over to show the jury exactly the, def the parts that were defectively designed. Uh, Bernie Jefferson actually tried the Drummond Lyford case and for some reason, Dave waved jury in front, of, in front of Bernie. That turned out to be a big, big mistake uh, because uh, Bernie not only found in favor of General Motors, but he wrote a 90-page opinion uh, not only exonerating General Motors uh, from any liability, but pointing out uh, that the Corvair was not defectively designed and really tearing our only expert apart, saying he wasn't qualified to give the opinions that he gave. Wow. And uh, that opinion was used by General Motors, in my case later on, as a authority uh, for my trial judge, where if we'd be arguing a legal point, and I'd be citing the California Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, and they'd be citing Bernie Jefferson's opinion. So uh, shortly after the jury came in in my case, um, I was getting ready to pick a jury in another Corvair case when General Motors asked Dave to come back to Detroit for a settlement conference, and Dave settled all the Corvair cases. So oh. we, didn't, we didn't have to try any more. But that's something to have one, that's quite, a, quite an accomplishment. I didn't come down for weeks, I was. I can imagine, and your family were, they were in. Uh, well, in, in, in fact, um, when, I, when the, the day after the jury came in, I, d I hadn't taken a vacation. And Dave, as a reward for me, he said, you didn't get to go to Hawaii, so I'm gonna send you back to Hawaii and the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel yes. hadn't been open very long at oh, that time. Yeah. And I remember him, we were sitting in his office and he reached back to his phone and buzzed his secretary on the phone, his assistant, and said, Lee, he said, I want you to call the Mauna Kea Beach Resort 
and make reservations for Mr. Aldrich and his family for a week, all expenses. So uh, the next morning we were getting ready to go to the airport and the phone rang. And the gentleman on the other end identified himself as uh, representing uh, NBC News. And they'd heard about the Corvair verdict and they wanted to know if they could come over to the house and tape an interview for the evening news, the NBC nightly news. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm on my way to the airport to catch a plane to Hawaii. So he said, well, would you mind if we met you at the airport? I said, well, fine, that'd be wonderful. So I told him I was flying, I forgot, say United Airlines. So he said, we'll meet you at the United counter. Hung up the phone and finished packing. The phone rang again. This time it was ABC News. So I made the same arrangements. We'll meet me at the United Airline counter. Okay. Well, boy, by the time I pulled up to the curb at the you United the Airline, celebrity of the I mean, I was the celebrity of the year. <laughs> and they, people were whispering, who's that? And uh, so I gave a very brief interview and never got to see the, mm -hmm. the airing because, of course, I was in yeah. Hawaii on vacation. So wonderful. So moving along, boy, we could talk about your cases and we would be here. They're so fascinating. I'm just, uh, I'm, so you were with Harney's firm for how long? What, what, I, I, how left, I left in about 1967, about a year after the Corvair case. Yeah. And um, then um, <clears throat> things were getting a little difficult at the firm for me with, with uh, Dave. Dave had a, he was a wonderful, brilliant man, but he had an ego as big, big ego. as all outdoors. Of course, yeah. And it was a little tough, I think, having this young whippersnapper yeah. win this Corvair case when he had now lost four Corvair cases in a row. And so it got to the point where I just felt it'd probably be better if I left. And I had a lot of offers from law firms uh, around Los Angeles to come to work, especially in light of that Corvair case. But um, I, had, I had just purchased my first home in South Pasadena. You were married and you had... Um, a child on the way. Yeah. And here I'm out watering my front lawn. I'd planted a dichondra lawn <clears throat> and my next door neighbor came over and he said, well, how are things going? And I said, well, Pete, funny you should ask. I, I married with house payments and an expectant wife, and I'm out of a job. And he said, well, he said, you remember Bob Stevens. And I, he was a lawyer that I'd met at one of Pete's parties. He said, well, he's working for a holding company out in Orange County that owns some insurance companies, and they're looking for a general counsel. Why don't you call Bob and so I called and they were and uh, I went out and interviewed and they grabbed me. Now now you're going to the some plaintiff's lawyers would say the dark side but you're going how did you feel about going into insurance this is a different well I was uh, I was not doing their, I was I was doing their legal work but not personal injury legal yeah. work I was doing their corporate oh. legal work and within six months, I became president of the company. Wow. So I was president of Casualty Insurance Company of My California. Goodness. So now you were, you had been a trial lawyer, that's what you were, and you were good at it. Right. And suddenly you're being a corporate lawyer now. What, how has that changed? That must have been a... It, 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 was, a, it was a big change, but uh, it, was a, it was a tough change because the company was under a, a um, not a receivership, but it was being overseen by the California Department of Insurance because it had some huge losses. And so what I was trying to do is recapitalize the company uh, to satisfy the insurance department. And we were ultimately successful in doing that. And then about three years later, the company was sold to okay. a... So after that, wow, that's quite a change. So then after that, what happened? I was out of a job again. Yeah. I had... Uh, no clients, no job. But during the time I was president of Casualty Insurance Company, um, a, 
I was trying to purchase a piece of property from Manufacturers Bank between San Diego and the Mexican border where I had reason to believe that there was going to be a big freeway interchange. Of course, the only problem was I didn't have any money. But um, I, had, I had testified at a bankruptcy hearing. Uh, the property was being held by a bankrupt estate. And uh, one of the lawyers that was representing Manufacturers Bank apparently was impressed with me because he called me after I'd opened my office in Hollywood at Highland Avenue and Franklin in the yes, I lived there Stanley there. Fulb building. Yes, yes. And uh, he called me and he said, Richard, he said, how much do you know about savings and loan law? Well, what do you need to know? I knew where the financial code was, that's about all. He said, well, he said, I have a very good friend, Charles Wellman. Charlie was really, really founded Glendale Federal Savings and Loan. And he also founded American Savings and Loan that um, I've forgotten the name of the man who, who owned American. Um, in any event, Charlie was the man behind that. And uh, Preston Martin, the Savings and Loan Commissioner, has just put Charlie in charge of a lot of troubled savings and loan associations. Lytton Savings and Loan, yeah. Long Beach Federal. There were 85 branches, and they need uh, a general counsel. Would this you, was in the 70s, right? This was in the early, yeah. early 70s, early yeah. 70, 71. Yeah. And so uh, he was said, Bart like, Littman, one of those. Bart Litton was a I just, character. That name just came up. <laughs> Bart Litton yeah. was a character. Yeah, real. I've met him. Yes, he was a character. He had uh, an art collection. Yeah. The only problem was, I think he was using the savings loans money to buy that collection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it went under in the savings yeah. loan crisis of the late 60s. And so uh, I met Charlie and he liked me and he said, would you represent us? So I was a savings and loan lawyer for about two or three years until Equitable was merged into Great Western Savings and Loan. And I really wanted my own practice at that, at that time. So Great Western offered me a job of counsel for them, but it would be an in-house yeah. counsel job. And I, I said, no, I really want to do my own thing. So I opened my- You opened your own practice? My own practice in alone. In, in, uh, I was still in, uh, still in Hollywood. <clears throat> and I had met an absolutely wonderful man as a client. His name was Robert N. Gold. Bob Gold was an expert at uh, shopping center law. And in fact, I don't know if people don't realize, but the, the supermarket as we know it today was started in Southern California by uh, the Weistein brothers. And up to that time, uh, you'd go into a market and the grocer would get your perch off, purchase off the shelf behind That's him right. yeah. and fill your shopping bag for you. But the Weistein brothers were the, were the first people to innovate the supermarket as we know it today and Bob Gold was their lawyer. And I represented Bob and his partner Jerry Snyder in some real estate litigation that they were in. And so... Um, just about the time I lost savings in uh, Great Western as a client, um, Bob came to me and said, let's open up an office together. And so then we moved to Beverly Hills into the Ray Holmes building on El Camino Drive. And that's where we practiced for the next 12 years. Yeah, you were there for a while. Long time. And uh, you did all kinds of things, didn't you? I did all kinds of work, but I was getting more and more into the plaintiff's personal injury yes. practice, uh, major injury cases, and more and more into medical malpractice. And you became, a, I mean, you were a preeminent trial lawyer, famous lawyer, very well regarded. Well, thank you. And expect, uh, I know federal judges who would 
talk about you and, and use the word preeminent. Well, thank you. You know, so uh, you, you had a talent and a, and a work ethic. I had a work ethic, and I, and I, I credit a lot of that to my experience with polio. Mm -hmm. I was always overcoming. Yeah. I was always wanting to be normal. Yeah. And that took something extra for somebody with a disability. Uh, it took an extra push, and I had to be better than I ordinarily would have been. But you have always been, because I've known you all these years as well, so well liked by everybody. I mean, even the stories you're telling people are coming to you. Hey, why don't you do this? I mean, it's like, it's like your personality attracted people. Well, uh, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I, I tell you, I'm still living off the reputation of that Corvair <laughs> case. People say, oh, right. you're the one that tried the Corvair case. Well, and I, so uh, that has, uh, was what really, I think, launched my career. And I started to get referrals from other lawyers. Uh, being a sole, I was a sole practitioner for the next 16 years. Yeah. And uh, that meant I was responsible for taking all the depositions and answering all the interrogatories and taking the case to trial and keeping my law office doors open while I did. I think that made you uh, also a preeminent trial judge because you knew what it was to really practice law. What, what prompted you to, to go on the bench? Uh, probably a lot of things. I, I've been thinking about that a lot um, since almost all of my cases when they went to trial were long trials, six, eight weeks, and not all in Los Angeles or Ventura some in Riverside, San Bernardino, and cases that would cause me to live in a hotel room for six or eight weeks, maybe getting home on weekends. And it got to a point by the, um, in the 80s, where I think I felt if I had to index another deposition, preparing for another cross-examination, it just started to take its toll. And I, I didn't know what, what I wanted to do, except I knew I did not want to retire. I did a very, very smart thing in the, in the late 89, late 80s. My wife and I bought a second home. And- uh, now, Tell us your, your wife and you had, how, where, tell us a little bit about when you were married, if you don't mind. Well, I, mar I met my wife, Joan, Joan Sullivan, yeah. uh, in uh, a parking lot in my building in my law office in Beverly Hills. And uh, I had uh, uh, dated some wonderful ladies, <clears throat> but long about 89, I'll never forget it, I was sitting in my, my office after hours with my secretary who'd been with me for 14 years. And uh, I had a, a practice, maybe I inherited this from Harney, but after hours, when I had some lawyers working for me, I had a bar in my office. And so after five, six o'clock, when the lawyers would get back from depositions or court, we'd open up the bar and we'd have a cocktail and we'd talk about our cases and talk about, well, that evening, it was just my secretary and I, and so we were having a cocktail and talking about things. And I said, you know, I said, and almost word for word, I've had my fill of dating. I've dated some wonderful ladies, but none of them have I wanted to marry. And she said, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to meet someone that's going to happen like that. You're going to get married. That was in March of 1979. In April of 1979, I was dry. I drove my car into the little parking lot in back of our building on El Camino Drive, and somebody was parked in my parking place. And parking places were golden. Still are. <laughs> and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this little white Fiat sports car pull into a parking space across the way. And I went to say, do you know who's parked in my... And I did a double take, and I saw the most beautiful woman I think I've ever seen in my life. And it was my wife, Joan. And in October of 79, on Halloween, we were married. Oh, how wonderful. In the, st in the study of our home in Westlake Village.
right. where I'd moved. In fact, I was building a home uh, in Westlake Village when I met her. Yeah. And we've been married now for uh, over 35 years. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, now, you mentioned just before, we'll get to the bench in just a moment, but you mentioned one of the smartest things you did was to have two homes. Did, were you saying something? Well, one of the smartest things I did was not to have two homes. Not to have two homes. Was not to have the two homes, but in, in, uh, in uh, 89, late 80s, I was actually thinking about retiring. So I told Joan, I said, uh, let's do this. I said, don't tell her anything. I asked her. Yeah. So let's go up to Pebble Beach and spend two weeks. I won't call the office, nothing. We'll just go up there and stay. After about five days, I was going crazy. I knew at that point I was not going to retire. And um, when I got back, I was having lunch with a, a person you mentioned earlier in this interview, Dickren Tavrizian, a wonderful friend. Yeah, was a federal judge. He was, uh, he was also on the, on the uh, municipal court. When I first went on the municipal court, we became friends. He was a superior court judge, a very successful practitioner. Then he was on the federal court. Now he's one of the leading mediators in the state. He is one of the brightest people you'll yeah. ever meet and, and a very positive person. And he said, well, he said, Richard, have you thought of maybe going on the bench? And I said, well, no, but it sounds like a good idea. And he said, well, put your application in. So I did. And I credit with Dickren a lot with being able to get me appointed to the Ventura Superior Court. I only applied to Ventura because I lived in Ventura. And... Uh, so I didn't get an appointment for a long time because, one, there were no openings until your colleague currently, Ken Yegan, was elevated to the Court of Appeal in Division Six, that a vacancy was created, and George Duke Majin, bless his heart, I think I was probably the last appointment he made as he was leaving his governor's office at the end of his term, really? uh -huh. I am sure in my mind's eye, he was reaching to turn out the light when he <laughs> says, oh, I better, I better appoint Aldridge to the Superior Court. So you so, came on to the Superior Court there. I came on to the Superior And you hit the ground running. I have to tell you just a very quick, funny story yes, about please. that. Yes, please. I had pretty much given up because it was the end of December, December 28th, 29th, and the Duke was leaving office. And so I'd given up getting an appointment. So I, I uh, asked Joan if she would like to spend the week between Christmas and New Year's in San Francisco on vacation, just the two of us. I said, I won't call the office. Um, and she said, okay, it's a deal. I said, and we'll do whatever you want to do. If you want to go shopping, I'll go shopping with you. If you want to go see a play, I'll go see a play with you. Whatever you want to do. That worked until, I think December 28th was a Friday, and I was taking her to a Post Trio restaurant on Post Street yes, in San Francisco. Yes, I know it, yes. And so it was a lovely restaurant, partly owned by Wolfgang Puck at that yes. time, I think. It was three owners, plus the trio. And as you walked into the restaurant, there was a wide staircase going down into the main restaurant. And so the hostess was seating us. And as we got to the bottom of the stairs, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a bank of pay telephones. This is before cell phones. And I said to Joan, I said, why don't you go ahead and, and take a seat? I'm going to call just make sure everything's okay at the office. Now, the only one at the office at that time was our receptionist, a young woman, uh, Tammy was her first name, I can't remember her last name. And my secretary had gone back to visit her family back east, and she had left Tammy a sheet of instructions. If the governor calls, explain that Mr. and Mrs. Aldrich are out of town, explain that you could reach him uh, immediately and a full sheet of instructions, and at the bottom in caps, do not put the governor on hold. 
And no cell phones then. And there were no cell phones then. <laughs> so when I called the office, I said, oh, Tammy, it's Mr. Aldrich calling. Oh, Mr. Aldrich, where have you been? Where have you been? I said, well, I'm here, Tammy. Now, hearing the tone of her voice, it was just some voice in the back of my mind that told me what was going on. I said, what's the matter, Tammy? She said, he called, he called. I said, well, who called? She said, the governor. I said, the governor? I said, what did the governor want? She said, he wants you to call him. I said, okay. So I called back and I didn't talk to the governor, but his appointment secretary and the, uh, Terry Flanagan at that time. Yeah. And, and uh, Terry said, the governor would like to appoint you to the Superior Court in Ventura County. And so that's the story. Of so my that's point. it. Wow. You had a drink to celebrate. We had a couple of glasses of wine. Now, um, I know all about you on the Ventura. Uh, you, uh, you, were, re you reviewed my cases. I was reviewing cases that were appealed from you. Now, I can say this, and I'm not saying it just because of, the, of our friendship or the great respect I have for you. Well, it's part of the reason for the great respect. But your decisions were actually, I mean, they were stunning. They were so good that we're, if we saw Aldridge's name on it, we'd say, uh, in fact, this is true. I'm, I'm revealing this. I didn't tell this to you before. So it's for all for posterity here. Our whole division, we said, what's he doing on the Superior Court? He belongs at least on the Court of Appeal, if not the Supreme Court. No, oh, thank you. Uh, your statements of decision were so crystal clear, and you had such insight into the practicalities of practicing law, as well as the application of the law. It was really, truly remarkable. Thank you. Uh, and you had, I mean, you, you wrought changes on the court right there, didn't you? you yes, you, I did. I did. We, we instituted what we called our multi-door courthouse. Um, the fast track and direct calendaring were just getting started in Ventura County then. And the case... Now, fast track, just so... You know, who knows who's going to be looking at this years hence. They may not understand that. But if just briefly, maybe the, you could tell us. The uh, Fast Track was a program instituted by the Judicial Council to speed up the resolution of cases. Uh, when I was trying cases in the superior courts around the state, it was not unusual for my cases to be five years old. And under the Code of Civil Procedure, if you don't bring a case to trial within five years of the time it's filed, it's subject to mandatory dismissal. So it was not at all unusual to call up your opposing lawyer when the five-year statute was getting close and say, will you stipulate to extend the five-year statute for six months or a year? So cases were languishing in the Superior Court. Um, the legislature saw this and said, you have to get your house in order, judicial branch. And so they passed the Delay Reduction Act. Um, what that did is mandated that, um, I think it was 80% of the cases be resolved in 18 months and 100% of the cases be resolved within two years. With that, they went to a direct calendaring method by which when a case was filed, it would be assigned to a particular judge, and that judge would be responsible for that case from beginning to end. Whereas in the past, like law and motion matters and so on, might be in front of a different judge. That, Correct. A judge different than the one that would ultimately hear the trial of the case. Exactly. So one judge was responsible for all aspects of the case. And the theory was that that judge would then be uh, knowledgeable about that case. Up to speed on the And case. up to speed, so the judge could uh, r make rulings quicker. Uh, I understand today the condition of our uh, law and motion departments, for example, are in abysmal shape. You have to call in Los Angeles Superior Court and reserve a date for a hearing on demur. And I've been told by uh, some Superior Court judges that if you call today, you wouldn't get a hearing date for six months. Hmm. That's not justice. No. And so in Ventura, we started the multi-door courthouse, which gave the parties multiple ways they could resolve their case. Uh, 
arbitration, mediation, uh, abbreviated jury trials where you might, you might agree to only try certain issues to a jury and then try other issues to a judge to shorten the length of the trial. So um, the bench bar media committee that, that uh, I helped start uh, was a committee we started to foster the relationship and understanding between the judicial branch and the media. Uh, we many times got cases wrong, didn't understand why cases were decided in a certain way. Uh, so things like that I tried to I tried to help the system. Not only did you help the system, I mean you were there a short time within a year or two you were receiving awards all over the place. If I can just digress just one sure, other thing please. and go back yes. to that San Francisco when I was appointed. Yeah. Because I, I have to say in all humility or lack thereof, I mean being appointed to the Superior Court, I was a little puffed up. So after a couple glasses of wine, oh, I, I told Tammy in the office, I, she said, oh, you're in all the Ventura papers. I said, well, Tammy, make photocopies and, and fax them up to the hotel we were staying. And she said, okay. So when my wife and I had finished lunch, the hotel was only across the street. So we walked across the street and I walked up to the desk and I said, uh, I'm Richard Aldrich, and I believe you have some faxes for me. Oh, he said, yes, we do. And he reached around, and he pulled out this stack of papers, and on the top sheet was a headline from one of the Ventura papers, unknown picked for Superior Court. <laughs> <laughs> that you, took the wind out of my sails. But you became known pretty quickly. So uh, you, you won some awards. I mean, I remember those awards. And you'd only been on the bench such a short time. You were the uh, Outstanding Jurist uh, of the Year by the Ventura County Bar Association, right? Yes. And uh, you, uh, you uh, were Judge of the Year. I mean, you had all these, yes. uh, and, and this is, I've never seen anything like this. You were, you were only on the court a few years before you, you moved up the ladder, to, so to speak. I did. But even in that short period of time, um, and you're sort of, people didn't know you, your practice was not in Ventura, right? No, and that's another and, thing. And that's why the headline, I think, they, yeah. they had called the, the president of the Ventura County Bar Association. Yeah. Who is this guy? They said, who? Yeah. <laughs> Richard who? Uh, and um, no, my, when, I, when I got on the bench, uh, having been a trial lawyer for 28 years before going on the bench, I had a, a, a great respect for what trial lawyers go through uh, in, in when they ask for a continuance. I understand why they're asking for a continuance or for more discovery on a certain issue. You've I been there. You've I've been, been there. there and you understood it. And I, and and I, still, I still understand it. Yes, of course. Got to keep that in mind. Um, uh, you were, in 1992, you were the uh, trial judge of the of the year, the trial uh, a bar just adored you, and uh, you were, I mean, everybody wanted to appear in front of you, and, uh, the, and then the county bar association, the larger bar association, uh, you were the outstanding uh, jurist of the year in 1992. And mm -hmm. those kind of awards are not easy to come by. You, and you're the new guy on the block and you get these awards, so it's, it, it was really quite a, quite a significant achievement. So. Um, so we're talking about all these um, these awards you've received, and you had a short stay uh, on the Ventura Superior Court, didn't you? In many ways, too short because I really liked that court. I liked the the people on it, the collegiality, uh, the lunch we gathered every day with the. We had a municipal court and a superior court then, and we all had lunch together and and could talk about things. I I, I very much enjoyed my time there. Um, but in, uh, and in fact, I had no thought of applying to the Court of Appeal. In fact, I remember two of my colleagues on the Ventura Superior Court took me out to lunch one day, and uh, Larry Storch and Alan Steele. Yes. And I remember they were sitting on one side of the booth, and I was on the other, and they said, I suppose you're going to apply, uh, apply to the Court of Appeal. And I said, well, 
No, I hadn't really given it any thought. And then people who I'd gone to judicial college with were getting appointed to the Court of Appeal, and I thought, oh my gosh, if they could do it, I could do it. So now, I, the judicial college, just so viewers will know. The judicial what that college is, is um, a a two week uh, indoctrination course uh, course uh, teaching judges how to judge, right. and it's it's uh, put on by uh, CJUR, which is the California Judicial Education and Research Arm of the California Judicial Council. And I taught at that judicial college for 20 years. You certainly did. We both did, yes. And uh, so it's a, it's a, two, a very worthwhile two-week uh, course. So you know other people were applying, so you applied. So uh, I applied. And uh, Governor Pete Wilson, uh, governor then, uh, appointed me to the Court of Appeal in Division Three. So you you had been on the on the Superior Court for about three years. About three years. Three huh? years, and you accomplished so much in three years. You turned that place upside down, made it more efficient, made it work better, and here you are on the Court of Appeal. Well, I had a lot of help. I want to tell you. I mean, one of the one of the spark plugs in Ventura at that time was Sheila Calibro, who was the court administrator yes. there, and. And I met Sheila the first day I came in to meet Ed Osborne, who was the presiding judge of the Ventura Superior Court. And Sheila and I hit it off immediately. And she really spurred me into getting into and doing things. Uh, she, had a, she had boundless energy and an unbounded imagination. And uh, so I didn't do any of this myself. Well, I had a lot you're of you're being modest, I understand. And we all know her, and she was quite a dynamo and helped get things done. She did. But um, so now you're on the Court of Appeal. I'm on the Court of Appeal. Division three, the division you're still in. Before I, before I got here, yeah. um, as you said, you and I have been friends for a long time. And in fact, when I was on the Superior Court and you were on the Court of Appeal, we became friends, uh, and we used to have lunch together periodically. And I remember one lunch particularly. We'd gone out to lunch, and apparently there was some word around that I might get appointed to the Court of Appeal. And I uh, remember you were telling me, you said, well, you know, Richard, I live in, Lo in Los Angeles County, and here I'm on the Ventura Court of Appeal. You live in Ventura County, and they're talking about appointing you to the uh, Los Angeles Court of Appeal. Maybe if you were appointed, how about we switch <laughs> positions? We did. we did have that discussion. And I re and I remember after getting appointed to the Court of Appeal, I, I think I called you and I said, Arthur, you remember our lunch about that discussion? You said, what lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy with my colleagues. And, where I, and it turned out it was a great thing for you as well because... Uh, the, uh, the closeness and the affection you have with your colleagues and the collegiality in your division are well known. And the same thing with my division, so I guess it turned out good for both of us. It, it turned out excellent for both of us. I, I, uh, I was very, very fortunate to be appointed to Division Three with Joan Dempsey Klein, who is a legend and uh, is retiring in uh, next, well, in less than a month. And she will be deeply, deeply missed, certainly by me, by the whole court. It will not be the same yeah. without, without Joan. She is, she is a unique person and a unique personality. And uh, and we, I just lost Walter Krosky. We just lost him, who's probably one of the greatest legal minds I've ever known. Um, and uh, uh, Patty Kitching and I are the, don't show this to Patty, the last men standing. Yeah. <laughs> Because, uh, and uh, while we have a wonderful new presiding justice in waiting, uh, Lee Smalley Edmund, it's not going to be the same. No. But I still think, uh, particularly with your personality and the others there, there'll be that collegiality, that warmth, that sharing of ideas and openness. So. And, and Lee has been with us now for yeah. about two months. He's been a pro tem, right? And, yeah. and it's going to be, the transition is seamless. Yeah. She's terrific. Yeah, so I, oh. I, I think that's going to be wonderful. So um, 
the innovator in you uh, just, uh, it will, it's, it's not going to stop now that you're on the Court of Appeal. As a matter of fact, you, uh, in addition to being a, a wonderful justice, and we'll talk about some of your opinions and the work you do, but you have been recognized for so many changes you were able to affect in California. Uh, the chief uh, recognized your abilities. Tell us a little bit about what you did in mediation well, and uh, uh, other areas. Being uh, a plaintiff's lawyer and, and knowing the plaintiff's bar as I did so well, um, I think the Chief Justice, starting with Malcolm Lucas and then with Ron George after him, um, as we talked about earlier, uh, when I became a judge, there was a municipal court and there was a superior court. And we had very, very capable, bright people on the municipal court that for one reason or another, timing being the biggest factor, uh, they never were never elevated to the superior court. Um, we thought that there would probably be a great saving of, of judicial resources, time, money, everything, if we could uh, unify the courts. But there was a great deal of resistance to the concept of unification, mainly coming from the superior court judges, not the municipal court judges. Uh, some, not all, not the majority, but some superior court judges felt that they were on a higher level than the municipal court judges and that it should stay that way. Uh, I certainly didn't agree with that because I knew just from my contact with the many of the municipal court judges in Ventura, they're every bit as bright as, as many of the superior court judges and, and uh, could do the job just as well if not better. So the first assignment I got was from Chief Justice Malcolm Lucas. And that was just after I was appointed to this court, the Court of Appeal, with Joan Dempsey Klein being my presiding justice. And he, uh, he formed the Blue Ribbon Commission. Let's see, what was it called? I think I, the Select uh, Committee, the select on, committee on, on Trial. Co Boy, they have these. Coordination Implementation. That's it. Wow. That's a yeah, big trial name. Court. And you chaired this. I chaired that. And who did he appoint to be on my committee? My presiding justice, Joan Dempsey Klein, and a, and a, a lot of very leading lights in the judicial community. And we were taking baby steps at that time. What I, what I envisioned at that time is we would, we would coordinate, I'd want to use the word unify, coordinate the administrative staffs of the two courts and bring that together. And if that worked, then I thought it would be an easier step to unify the, the uh, judges, the courts. And so uh, we, did, we were successful in getting that done. The Judicial Council approved that coordination of the administrative staffs. And so then we started on uh, unification. And uh, uh, Chief Justice then asked me if I would uh, be a mediator and chair a committee to bring the municipal court, mainly Los Angeles, because they're the largest, largest court. court in the country, yeah. bring the municipal court and the superior court together. So the task force that you chaired. The task force that I chaired. And uh, I don't think we reached uh, consensus or even agreement, but we got the parties talking. Yeah. And that was the first step to getting them talking. And not too long after that, the legislature acted and unified the courts. Now, what became and always has been important, but particularly today more than ever, is um, is the um, bringing the parties together so they can avoid court. They can have a mediation, a settlement, because court should be the last resort. That's always been a passion of yours. It has. And I recall uh, at your uh, confirmation hearing, uh, you were discussing that. And you became very instrumental in instituting programs in that area. In fact, I instituted one here at the Court of Appeal in the second district uh, just after I got here. Uh, and uh, in many respects, it was much easier to institute these programs at the trial level where you didn't have a winner or a loser. 
uh, it was much more difficult instituting it here at the Court of Appeal. Sure, somebody's when you, won when, when you have an absolute winner yeah. and an absolute loser. But with the appellate bar's help, uh, we had many meetings and uh, during which we discussed pressure points. What, do you, what are the pressure points in trying to get a, an appeal settled? Uh, the standard of review was a good example. Uh, a lot of lawyers, I'm sure you find it in your court, I certainly still do in, in Division Three. lawyers really don't understand the standard of review. They think that we can retry the facts. Yeah, when trial lawyers tend to argue ap appeals, you find that a lot, don't you? Right. Yes, and uh, we have constraints, and they don't understand it all the time. And, and so uh, that's one of the, I call it pressure points. I mean, that's not a very good term to use, but a, a lever, a lever to bring the parties together to reason. Uh, but I think the most important part of the program that we have here is that it's an, it, it gets them together early before the record is prepared, before everybody has gone to the expense of, of writing briefs, paying for the records. And by last count, we have a success rate of over 40% wow, in the Court of, of Our for Appeals. For the Court of Appeal, that is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Wow. So, uh, wow. Um, you also were involved. We have, the, you know, the w world's become more complex. The laws beco become more complex. And we have what we call complex um, litigation. We do. Uh, which can take forever and bring in parties from different parts of the country and uh, different manufacturers and so on, and it becomes so unwieldy. You were quite significant in, uh, in, uh, in bringing some reforms about in that area. I was, um, and that started uh, almost by happenstance. Uh, there are a few states in this country that have business courts, and those courts are, for example, New York is, is probably the prime example. Well, Delaware is the Delaware Chancery Courts are the originators, but those are only Chancery Courts. They're not law courts. New York was the first one to, to set aside a branch of their trial court to be a business or commercial division, they call it. And the idea was floated uh, here that it might be a good idea in California if California started a business court or a commercial division. Uh, by this time, uh, Ronald George was our Chief Justice and he asked that I chair a business court study task force to explore the uh, feasibility and the desirability of forming a commercial division in California. So we formed a task force to do that. I chaired the task force. and. Uh, I went back to New York, uh, met the judges of their commercial division, met their chief judge, Ju uh, Judith Kay, very impressive woman, yes. um, and I studied their model. Um, I also then took a survey in California of judges and lawyers of whether they were in favor, and legislators I should add of whether they were in favor of forming a business court. Um, and as a follow-up question, I asked if the answer to number one is no, how would you feel about a complex litigation court? Having in mind that not all complex cases are business cases and not all business cases are complex. Uh, much to my surprise, the results were overwhelming. From the, the legislature, they were against a business court as such, but were overwhelmingly in favor of a complex litigation court. Uh, the trial bar, primarily the personal injury trial bar, bar, were overwhelmingly against the formation of a business court but were in favor of a complex court. I think the fear on the part of the bar was is that we would be taking the best and brightest judges out of their exactly. pool yeah. and putting them in a commercial division. And But 
having in mind that there are personal injury and product liability cases that are very complex, they could opt into the complex litigation court. And so that's how the idea was germinated. And I, I remember the night I was tasked with giving a report on the business court study task force to the Judicial Council at one of their meetings in San Francisco. And uh, not knowing how it was going to be received, my recommendation was going to be against forming a business court. And then I, I had to float this idea of a complex litigation court. And in my mind, the first hurdle I had to get over was the Chief Justice. Because he would sent me on, a, on a mission, mission, another mission, and here I was changing the agenda completely. And we weren't in San Francisco. We were in one of the smaller venues up in Northern California. And I can remember he was just driving away, and I wouldn't let him go. I had my hand <laughs> on the sill of the car talking about this complex litigation court. And then the next morning, I gave my report to the Judicial Council. And within about four months, uh, the chief authorized the establishment of the complex litigation task force. And it's chugging ahead with full steam today. Full steam, and, and thankfully, it's still being funded yes. in these lean times. And it has to be. I mean, it's really... Uh a critical court. In fact, you wrote a book. I mean, actually, you wrote the desk book. The desk you? book on the uh, because uh, judges have to have real expertise in handling these complex cases, right. and you wrote the book that helps them do that. It was the first draft of the book, and now it's uh, it was taken over by Thomson Reuters, I think, yeah. and they now do the updates one of the on big the book. Publish, but you, big publishing, but you're the house. one that wrote it, but and it's it was the desk book of the management of complex, complex litigation, civil cases, or litigation. This is used not just in California, is it? It's, no, it's, in fact, it, I've, is, I've lectured, all over the lectured nationwide on it. Now, you, you're doing all this while you're, you're keeping up with your caseload. Yes. I mean, th this is extra. Co we have to make clear, this sounds like a full-time job, uh, which it is, but you're doing a full caseload while, full while, caseload. All, while all this is going on. Now, uh, of course, it, the, the, the kudos don't stop. It keeps going on. You were you uh, you were on so many committees. Uh, uh, you uh, you uh, were actually appointed to the judicial council. I was for, uh, for four. Uh, I was on for four years. Yeah, and that's a very important body. It's a, it's really t tell us a, just a little bit about what you do there. It's it's um, the constitutionally mandated body that manages the courts in California. And when I say manages the courts, they are responsible for for uh, dispersing the funding of the courts, everything from buying paper clips to funding judges' salaries uh, to uh, f formulating the California rules of court and uh, everything having to do with the keeping our courts running in California. We are... Uh, A huge in, jurisdiction, larger than most foreign countries. Well, larger than most foreign countries. We're, to my knowledge, the largest court system in the world, yeah. and uh, terribly underfunded. It's a, it's a tragedy. I talk to trial lawyers and trial judges today, and and there's not enough funding. We're closing courthouses so that litigants have to travel hours just to get to court. We have such financial burden uh, problems now. Let's hope whoever's watching uh, this particular interview in the future will say, gee, things were bad back then, but they're great now. <laughs> Let's well, our that's our the budget, case. I think, it, it used to be only 2% of the state budget. Yeah. Now it's, I think, 1% or yeah. less than 1%, and we're supposed to be a co-equal branch of government. Yeah. It's, it's tragic. And, and I, uh, it's, it's, it's not only tragic, it's, I want to emphasize the tragedy is not just for the judicial branch, the tragedy is for the people of the, the state people. of California who can't get to court. Who can't get to court? Can't get their cases And so, resolved. what we're doing is we're forcing them outside the court system to arbitrations and mediations and other types of alternative dispute resolution, where the taxpayers have paid for them to be able to resolve their disputes before us. Yeah, we're all crying about this now. We could we could talk 
forever about forever this. Forever about it. Uh, you were on a number of uh, committees as well when you were on the Judicial Council. You chaired committees. I did. Uh, ranging from all kinds of things. You were on, on blue ribbon panels for the efficiency of experts, right? Or the Fair and Efficient Administration of Justice is called the Rubin, Blue Ribbon Panel of Experts yeah. on the Fair. Right. And, and we, we hit everything, including, and it goes right back to our funding argument, including court fees and how much litigants should be charged for filing a complaint in the Superior Court. I think when I started in practice in 1963, uh, filing a complaint was about 40 or $50. A complex case today is a thousand or two thousand oh, yeah. dollars. I'm told now that if you want to file a motion, you have to pay a filing fee. Where does the middle class and the poor are completely or the poor are out of the system are completely out of the system, frozen out of the system. Mm. Now you've also um, you've taught at the at the judges college for for several years. I taught a course for almost twenty years. Uh, on civil settlement techniques. And, and you've uh, actually gone, I know people who have gone to the, in fact, I've even observed uh, the, uh, your, your uh, class, and it's really quite impressive. You brought some great litigators up and actually did settlements. We actually, every year, we bring lawyers up to the Judicial College, it's usually in, in Berkeley, uh, at the University of California, and we had we held actual settlement conferences and tried to get the cases settled. We usually were able to settle them. And you could show different techniques that could be used to do that for the judges. We had, when we started, it was an entire day course. So in the morning we would lecture them on how, this, these are the techniques that you use. And then in the afternoon, I would usually be the judge who would conduct the settlement conference and I would show them how I employed the techniques. And uh, for example, you can settle most of a case, but if there are some issues hanging out there, then get the parties to agree to stipulate to send those few issues to arbitration. The, the, the uh, key thing I tried to impart to all the students was never leave the case in the same condition you found it. Right. Change it in some way because it's going to change the dynamic. Right, and it's going to always, always be changed for the better, isn't it? Always. So um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about your work on the Court of Appeal, uh, some of the significant cases. I don't want to embarrass you by all these awards you uh, received, but I think, uh, I think viewers would really, really like to know about it. Um, when you were practicing law, I mean, you were, uh, they have this uh, survey of the best lawyers in America, and every year, I mean, you were always, you were, you were in that list all the time. And uh, you, you were the most respected lawyers, that was in the California Lawyer Magazine, and you were the uh, recipient of the American Board of Trial Advocates, Trial Lawyer of the Year, and we all also mentioned Judge of the Year. And uh, you were also considered one of the Los Angeles's most powerful judges in, in 2000. I don't know what powerful means, but I think it means respected. And um, tell us about uh, the Consumer Lawyers uh, awarded you a very prestigious award named after one of our great Chief Justices. That was the thing that makes that award very special is its namesake, the Ro Roger Trainer Award. I think Roger Trainer was one of our greatest uh, Supreme Court Justices. Um, and uh, that was uh, awarded in, I think it was 2000 and time goes, one? I think it was, uh, that was 2000, I think. 2000. Yeah. And uh, so it was, um, the consumer attorneys are the, is basically the plaintiff's bar and, uh, and uh, gave me that award. That's and right. And in 2006, the Judicial Council gave you a very prestigious award, the uh, Jurist of the Year Award. That was the Jurist of the Year. Yeah, uh, not, no surprise there with all the uh, contributions you well, made. Well, it, it surprised me. and um, In fact, the day the award was announced, I was on the Judicial Council at that time, but I had driven up to the Judicial Council meeting from Monterey, and I misjudged traffic. And so I walked in 
as they were announcing the award. And as I walked through the door, people started applauding. <laughs> I had no idea what they, were, what they were applauding for. But I heard the Chief Justice, Ron George, uh, talking about the award. And the only thing I could think of saying was, well, Chief, I want to thank you and everyone for this great honor. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Could I ask what it is? <laughs> A great laugh. <laughs> Oh, so, wonderful. And then uh, the chief said it's the jurist of the year. Well, you've uh, also distinguished yourself as, uh, as a scholar on the court. You've uh, helped shape uh, the law of California over the years. And uh, before we close, and then you may have some closing comments you'd like to make, uh, tell us about some of the cases that mean the most to you or some significant cases you participated in. I, I think I think one of the cases I have to tell you that gave me the most satisfaction was a case I dissented in and the Supreme Court took and reversed. Great. That's always a good feeling, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, and and it was so much sweeter because the majority was written by a, a justice who I have the utmost respect for, and that was Walter Krosky. He may have even taken the case away from me and talked one of the other the other justice on the panel to, to go, go with, with him. him instead of your view. And it was a case entitled Simmons versus Gaderi, and it was a case involving mediation, and uh, uh, the. Uh, Doctor, it was a doctor. It was a medical malpractice case, and Doctor Goderi was going to a mediation of of the case that had been filed by her patient against her. And her particular insurance company required that before they go to mediation, they get a consent in writing from the doctor to settle the case up to a particular amount. And in this case, the insurance company uh, had Doctor Goderi sign a consent to settle the case for an amount up to and including $125,000. They went into the mediation, and in the mediation, the lawyer ultimately offered $125,000. The plaintiff took it, and the Dr. Goderi's lawyer came out into the courtroom. She was sitting there waiting and said, well, congratulations, doctor. We settled your case. She said, how much? And they said $125,000. She said, what? I'm not, you're not going to pay $125,000 for that case. And she revoked her consent. Um, <clears throat> Walter was firmly of the opinion that she had waived any mediation confidentiality when she signed the consent before the mediation. I dissented and I said, you can't have a judicially created exception to the mediation confidentiality law statute. That would undermine the whole idea it would of mediation. Under, it right? would undermine the whole idea of mediation uh -huh. and the confidentiality. And Walter disagreed and disagreed and so I said, well, okay, Walter, you do the majority and I'll dissent. And I did and the Supreme Court took that case and in due course reversed and, and I think mentioned both Walter and me by name. Oh. Yeah, that's so, always nice. On occasion, they'll do that. Yeah, when they're on your side, when they're against you, and they mention your name, you don't like it. And uh, uh, um, some other cases that well, come to one, mind. Well, one one is uh, not too old, uh, Lafille versus Watrous, and that's a it's a very interesting case, uh, which I heard twice. And it was a man who was injured in a machine like a lathe, although he wasn't lathing wood, it was metal, it was steel, a steel bar. And the employer had taken a guard off the bar, which allowed a piece of the die to fly out of the machine and hit Mr. Watrous in the head and injured him quite severely. Uh, so there is an exception to the workers' compensation exclusivity rule. 
And so for any non-lawyers watching this years from now, if you are injured and it's on the job in the course and scope of your employment, and if that injury is due to the negligence of your employer, then you can't sue your employer in superior court in, in a civil lawsuit. You are limited in your remedy to workers' compensation. The first appeal that came to us in that case was from Mrs. Watrous when the uh, Superior Court had granted a summary judgment against her on her workers' compensation, I mean on her uh, loss of consortium claim. She claimed that she lost the love of the, uh, uh, her husband's love, affection, due to the time he was injured, the loss of consortium. Um, <clears throat> I looked at that case and it looked to me as though that Mr. Watrous's injury fell within the the uh, punch press exception to the workers' compensation exclusivity rule. Uh, and that's by statute. It says that if many, many workers were being injured by these punch presses, there are huge machines that come down and form metal parts, usually for automobiles. And what was happening is that some of these machines were operated with a foot pedal. And so the poor worker was putting the, the piece of metal into the machine when inadvertently would trip with his foot or her foot the, the uh, punch press and that punch press had come down and take off their fingers or seriously injure them. So the legislature established the punch press exception to the workers' compensation exclusivity which allows the worker to sue in superior court for damages. Quite apart from any workers' compensation. A apart from any workers' compensation they award they might receive. So I looked at Mrs. Watrous's case and I thought, well, it looks like Mr. Watrous comes within the punch press exception and so it looks like he's not going to be limited to workers' compensation. So in her consortium claim certainly is derivative of his personal injury claim. Therefore, if he's not bound by workers' compensation, then she shouldn't be bound by it. So I reversed the trial court. Supreme Court reversed me and said somehow she's part of the whole workers' compensation scheme. And therefore, even though he might not be uh, covered by the workers' compensation exclusivity rule, she is. What does the Supreme Court know? <laughs> I, I, it, I still don't understand that. Neither do I, but you know, rationale. courts change, and sometimes that issue may, in fact, it's about, it's due to change. Well, and that issue could come back, you never could. know. Now, the irony of, the reason I raised that particular yeah. case is the irony of all ironies is, let's see, I, the Supreme Court denied a summary judgment to the employer on Mr. Watrous's civil action because he claims he, he claimed he was covered by the punch press exception and he filed a civil complaint and they moved for summary judgment. The court denied that and they, they took a, a, a writ. They brought, came up here on a writ. And I looked at that, and now here's a guard. The employer was undisputed. The employer had taken the guard off. Because the guard was taken off, that allowed a piece of the die to fly out of the punch press and hit poor Mr. Watrous in the head, injuring him. And my initial read through of the briefs was, of course the punch press exception applies. And then I started thinking, is this really a punch press? And after an extensive amount of research, came to the conclusion this was not a punch press. And therefore, the punch press exclusion doesn't, doesn't even apply, apply as to poor all. Mr. After all, to Mr. Watrous. And the Supreme Court has just denied a review in that, in that wow. case. But I defined what a punch press is. Isn't that amazing? And this has been so helpful because people who watch this interview 
particularly students, will see the process that one goes through deciding a case and how language is so uncertain and, how we ha and what it takes to go through a decision-making process. That's the beauty of this job. Yeah. So uh, my trial lawyer friends are constantly asking me, don't you miss the trial court? And uh, aren't you lonely up there? I say, absolutely not. I said, first of all, every time I open a new set of brief, briefs, it's like opening an issue of the National Enquirer. You are seeing life as it's lived. I said, it's fascinating. And I say, plus, the interaction with my colleagues on the court is fascinating. And reasoning through an issue, and as you pointed out, the... Uh, fallibility of the English language. That's what we deal in. We deal in the English language. And, and uh, getting to the bottom of these problems is much more difficult sometimes than it first appears. Well, um, it's been a pleasure interviewing you and uh, talking with you. And uh, I found it to be an educational experience for me. And, and a sheer joy to spend this time with you. Well, Thank it's, you so it's a, always a joy, Arthur, to be with you anytime, anywhere. Thank you for doing this.